Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. This JCO podcast provides observations and commentary on the Journal of Clinical Oncology article, quote, an EORTC phase three trial of adjuvant whole brain radiotherapy versus observation in patients with one to three brain metastases from solid tumors after surgical resection or radiosurgery, quality of life results, end quote, by Ricardo Sassietti et al. My name is David Asoba, and I am a quality of life consultant and a retired professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. My oncologic specialty is medical oncology. Patients who present with or develop brain metastases from solid systemic tumors present a therapeutic conundrum. Should asymptomatic brain metastases from solid tumors be managed by antineoplastic therapy to reduce the tumor mass in the brain? If the brain metastases are treated, what is the best therapeutic approach, and when should it be applied? What are the benefits to the patient, and how should they be measured? One thesis is that treatment directed at early brain metastases will benefit the patient by preventing potentially devastating symptoms and thereby improve health-related quality of life. In addition, treatment of the brain may prolong the time to disease progression in the brain and even prolong life if the primary cancer can also be controlled. However, all therapeutic measures bear the potential of producing side effects. Therefore, it is important to determine whether the benefit of treating brain metastases outweighs the possible adverse impact of the treatment side effects. The publication that accompanies this podcast describes an EORTC study of the effects of whole brain radiotherapy on patient reported outcomes measured by the assessment of health-related quality of life. This study randomized patients who had one to three brain metastases from solid tumors to either whole brain radiotherapy or to observation only. Before being registered on the study, the patients either had open surgical resection or had radiosurgery to treat the metastases. The results of the primary endpoints were presented elsewhere and showed a small but probably beneficial effect on the time it took for patients with tumor progression in the brain to reach a WHO performance status greater than two in the arm treated with whole brain radiotherapy as compared to those in the observation-only arm. However, there was no difference in overall survival. Surgical salvage treatment of new or progressing brain metastases was required more often in the observation-only arm than in the whole brain radiotherapy arm, 51% versus 16%. Fewer patients treated with whole brain radiotherapy died of recurrence in the brain than did in the observation-only group. Thus, it might be expected that patients treated with whole brain radiotherapy would report better health related quality of life than would patients who were only observed. Measurement of health related quality of life was a secondary endpoint in this study. After randomization to whole brain radiotherapy or observation only, patients' health related quality of life was assessed at baseline and at eight weeks after start of local therapy, either surgery or radiosurgery and every three months thereafter for three years, or until the WHO performance status reached greater than two, or whichever came first. The assessment tools were the EORTC QLQC30, a general self-assessment questionnaire designed for all patients with cancer, and the EORTC BN20, designed for patients with primary brain tumors. There are no pre-existing data on the expected direction or degree of change of the QLQC30 or BN20 scores in this population. Therefore, only six of the 24 scales and single items in these questionnaires were chosen a priori for detailed analysis in order to avoid the statistical problem associated with testing of multiple endpoints. The six scales were global health, physical, role, cognitive, and emotional functioning, and fatigue. 
statistical significance is set at less than 0.05, and clinical relevance at a difference of more than 10 points in scores between the two groups. Problems associated with missing data were handled by currently acceptable statistical methodology. The results show that patients in the observation-only arm reported better scores in five of the five five of the six aforementioned scales, that is, global health, physical role, and cognitive functioning, and in fatigue at one time or another during the first 12 months of follow-up as compared to patients treated with whole brain radiotherapy. Prior local treatment, open surgery or radiosurgery, did not have an effect on these results. Although the remaining scales and items on the questionnaires are not examined in detail, Patients in the observation arm reported better social functioning, bladder control and communication deficit, and less drowsiness, hair loss, motor dysfunction, weakness of legs, nausea and vomiting, and constipation than did those treated with whole brain radiotherapy. The authors offer some possible explanation for their results. Patients in the observation-only arm were followed by regularly scheduled MRI and thus may have had an early detection of asymptomatic brain metastases, subsequent salvage treatments may have been effective in maintaining health rate of quality of life. However, if patients on, the whole, on whole brain radiotherapy followed a similar protocol, should they not have had an equal opportunity to benefit from the salvage therapy of early asymptomatic disease? Unfortunately, there's no information in the manuscript about whether this may have been the case. Another possible explanation for the results is that more patients in the group treated with whole brain radiotherapy had systemic disease progression as compared to the observation arm, 46% versus 33.5%, and the treatment of the systemic disease may have adversely affected the health-related quality of life results. Again, data pertinent to this point seems not to have been collected. Other limitations of the study were poor questionnaire completion rates resulting in missing data, and a failure to assess neurocognitive functioning in more detail. Although this study was the first to assess health-related quality of life in patients randomized to whole brain radiotherapy or observation only, there are other studies on the effects of whole brain radiotherapy used with or without other treatment modalities. A recent literature review of the effects of whole brain radiotherapy concludes that neurocognitive decline is predominant four months after therapy but may follow a biphasic pattern with a late irreversible impairment several months or years later. Factors that influence neurocognitive decline include the pretreatment cognitive status and the control of brain metastases. Although neurocognitive functioning may improve with time, it has not been sufficiently assessed in long-term survivors. What are we to conclude from the above studies? It is difficult to make any firm conclusions. One obvious deficiency is that the completion rates of the quality of life questionnaires was poor. Since health-related quality of life was an endpoint, albeit a secondary one, missing data is a serious drawback to the clear interpretation of the results. Statistical maneuvering only supplies imputed values, which are calculated guesses and does not really make up for missing data. It is time for investigators designing and carrying out clinical trials in which quality of life is an endpoint to view missing data that was not obtained even though the patient was alive and able to fill out the questionnaires as a protocol violation. The application of this rule would lead to more careful collection of the data. Despite the above weakness, it is clear from this and other trials that whole brain radiotherapy is not innocuous. The deleterious effects on neurocognitive functioning and other quality of life domains must be balanced against any potential benefits, such as fewer patients requiring salvage therapy and reduced symptoms from the metastases. This is an important challenge to the decision-making surrounding these patients. Studies designed to ask patients for their opinions will be necessary to supply informed answers. The answers may depend on an individual's risk of averseness to symptoms from brain metastases versus the side effects of whole brain radiotherapy. This aspect of bedside decision-making needs to be studied. In this study, the possible effects of the salvage therapy in patients in the observation-only arm on quality of life are commented on but were not studied. This component of any similar trials in the future should be given attention, particularly since it may have an important influence on the quality of life results. Perhaps it could even lead us to consider waiting until brain metastases become symptomatic before prescribing treatment. In the meantime, experimental approaches should be limited to clinical trials, the routine use of whole brain radiotherapy for asymptomatic brain metastases is 
not yet ready for prime time. This concludes this JCO podcast. Thank you for listening. For more original research, editorials, and review articles, please visit us online at jco.org. This production is copyrighted to the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you for listening.